All right. Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. God sits in his throne as he always has, and he rules over those whose hearts are open and obedient to him. And he gives us his spirit. Praise him in that. So we are going to pick up in part two, the unmarried. So last week, um, and I actually have a couple questions that were submitted. One actually came up in discussion last Sabbath after the sermon, and then one was sent to me in an email, so I'll go over those, and then if there's any others. But so last week's sermon actually went a little longer than I had wanted it to, and I didn't want this to be the same. So actually, I'm going to do a, a sermonette next week that's just going to... So I'm going to go get through 1 Corinthians 7, but uh, next Sabbath, I'm going to do a sermonette that is just going to be a summary and a review of everything that we talked about. So as last week and this week, we're going to go into in depth into some things. So when we do that, sometimes it's hard. You, you lose the forest for the trees. And so rather than spend another 15 or 20 minutes today tacked onto the end of the sermon to do that, I'm going to take that and do it next week. I think that'll just be much clearer and easier to absorb. So that being said... Praise God in all things. Let's take a look here before we dive back into 1 Corinthians 7 at um, Paul's exegesis on what marriage is intended to represent. So there's probably no better place to look at that than in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33. So we'll go through each of these verses. We'll talk about them a little bit. So we'll start off here with verses 22 through 24. And here Paul starts off, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So Paul starts off here with a hierarchy, a what some people would call uh, a complementarian framework for marriage. Uh, there's a couple, so that generally scripture presents marriage as a complementarian or a complementary relationship that each, the husband and the wife, each have unique and specific roles that complement each other in the marriage, and that God has uniquely equipped by the nature of being a male or a female, and then on top of that, by receiving his spirit through Christ, to actually fulfill and live in those roles. So that's a great thing. It's not, it isn't, these aren't, these aren't shackles that God is giving us to like, oh, this is, I got to do this. We are designed to do this. This is like the, the diet that God gave us for a marriage. And if we follow his properly prescribed diet, we will have a fruitful and happy marriage. Um, I was actually, as I was digging into this, these verses um, and, and doing some research, I was surprised to find that there is somewhat of a tide of resistance to taking these verses out of Ephesians and saying that, th that Paul is saying that marriage is a type or an illustration, that, that human marriage is a type or an illustration of Christ's marriage to his church. But I think there's two main reasons that the people that do reject that reject it. One, in time past, it seems like most of the people that vehemently rejected the idea that Paul here in these verses is, is comparing man and woman marriage to Christ and the church marriage in any sense whatsoever is that it was a complete kick against the Roman Catholic Church because of what they did with marriage and they made it a sacrament and it's somehow equal to baptism as if somehow that's... And, and what they did with the priests, where they couldn't marry, and all the mess that they made out of that, so that it seemed to be a reaction to that. And then in more modern times, people more reject this section of Scripture as Paul talking about marriage because they don't like the idea of women have to submit to men. And so they're like, well, no, that's really not what Paul's talking about here. Yeah, I know the church is supposed to submit to Christ, absolutely, but women submit to men, no, 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 no. So that's that's the other main reason that people kick against the idea that this is Paul's illustration of marriage in comparison to Christ and his church or his bride. So going on to verse 25 here, Paul writes here, just as he talked to the wives, now he talks to the husbands. Husbands, love your wives 
even as Christ also loved the church and he gave himself for it. So that's a big thing. It's a little sentence, but that's a big thing. He gave. What does that mean? What did he do? He died for the church. I mean, he physically died. Not only did he being God come down here and dwell in the flesh and endure all the persecution and the difficulty that humanity put on him, the perfect man, but he actually physically endured a horrendous death because he loved his bride so much. He laid down his life. And why did he do that? Well, the next couple of verses, verses 26 and 27, tell us now with, especially in English with the pronouns, they can be confusing. So I've kind of interjected the actual proper noun in the places in this verse, these verses here where the pronouns are, just so it's very clear what Paul is writing about here. So I'm going to read the proper names. I'm not adding or taking away from scripture and just trying for clarity. So please, you can look these verses up on your own. So then Jesus, that Jesus might sanctify and cleanse the church with the washing of the water by the word that Jesus might present the church to his, to Jesus, to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that the church should be holy and without blemish. So that's why he died for it. That's why he gave himself for the church. So that's what Paul is saying here. So that's a very high standard that Paul, that scripture, that God sets for the role of the husband in the family. So it's not like, oh, I only have one little couple words to go to wife. She got all kinds of stuff she got to do. But me, I got it easy. No, actually, it's much more difficult. The role that, but, but both are uniquely equipped if they submit to their heavenly father and receive the spirit. Both are equipped, even though it might be difficult at times, but both are equipped to live and fulfill the roles in which they will be the happiest and the most fruitful in their own lives, in their marriage, and for the church and the world. So this is why he died for it, and Paul enjoins the husband that you, in like manner, should die for your wife for this reason, to lift her up, to make her a glorious wife, that if she has rough spots and difficulties, that you are the avenue by which she can find the best support apart from her Heavenly Father, of course, to be able to overcome and grow out of those things. That you don't want your wife to be a wife that should be ashamed by the way she acts. You want to be able to provide everything that she possibly could need to be able to overcome those things. And likewise, she has a role to be able to help you in support of you as well to be able to overcome things that we have difficulty with. Certainly men have difficulties as well. But not in the same, not in the same areas necessarily. So it's going on to verses uh, 28 through 31. Paul says here, So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loves his wife loves himself. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, even as the Lord, the church. Again, it's clear that Paul has drawn an analogy, an, a, a, type, a typology, a comparison between uh, the, the church, his relationship to the church, and a husband's relationship to the wife, and vice versa, the church's relationship to him, and the wife's relationship to the husband. Clearly, he is doing that. And here he says, um, this, this sentence here, he that loves his wife loves himself, for no man has ever hated his own flesh, so that might confuse some people, because what about people like that commit suicide, for example? Don't they hate their own flesh? Or what about people that, you know, do self-flagellation? They like, they enjoy, you know, they, they want to punish themselves. So isn't that somebody who doesn't love their own flesh? No, absolutely not. In fact, it's the exact opposite. So suicide, while well, this is a broad stroke, so if anyone is having suicidal thoughts, they should be discussed, but Still, ultimately, it always comes down to whatever the circumstances were, suicide comes down to a selfish act. It's like my state in life is untenable. And, and why are we in the state we're in? Because that's what God has put us in. That's true of all of us, no matter what. Now, we may have played a role in that. Others may have played a role in that, but nonetheless. So suicide is just, I, I'm forget it, God, you were wrong. I'm out of here. And you can't, they can't think of any other way to do it. So 
again, not to make small or light a suicide. Uh, I don't want to dig into that too much. Suicide is something that plagues people, minds. They get fixated on that. And if you are, if you know someone or if you are, please seek out godly counsel. Don't, don't be ashamed of it. Don't be afraid to talk about it. But realize that the fact that some people commit suicide does not make this verse wrong or doubtful in its application. It does not. Going on to verses 30 through 33. Paul says here, for we, the church, are members of Jesus' body, um, of his flesh, and of his bones. Uh, yeah, okay. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. So here he makes a clear comparison, for we, the church, are members of his body, of Jesus' body, the church. So again, this is, I really don't understand how people can look at these verses and say that Paul is not drawing a comparison between husbands and wives and Christ and the church. It's just so much in there, but nonetheless. So if you run across someone who, who kicks against that, you should dig deeper into, well, why are you saying that? Why are you saying that? So Paul leads this out. This is pretty straightforward. Um, and and it's, uh, it's right out of Genesis. It's not anything new. But Paul here, now he goes on this next set of verses here in verse uh, 33. He says here, this is a great mystery. So people take this to be, oh, it's a mystery. It's like we don't know what it is. No, in this case here, the word mystery isn't intended as it's like something secret that you can't know. But it was at one point in time not as clear. Paul uses his word mystery actually earlier in this same letter in chapter 3 when he's talking about the mystery that Gentiles are also fellow heirs of the inheritance. That was, in time past, a mystery. It wasn't secret. It wasn't hidden. It was never, it's not like God came up with a new plan. But it was a mystery in the sense that at the time that, that Christ came, was crucified, and rose from the dead, and, and they began to go out and saw the Gentile world converted, it was a big surprise to them. They were not ready for it. So in that sense, it was a mystery. It was a surprise. And so in the same sense, Paul uses this here. He says, well, this is a surprise because in time past, it would have been very national Israel-centric. Israel, the physical nation of Israel, and only those people who were physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are going to be his bride. But the mystery is that, no, anyone who is Christ can be a member of his bride. And so, surprise, and that's why earlier, and uh, last week he talks, when he was giving examples of um, stay as you are called, he used a circumcision example as one example. If you were called circumcised, then remain. Don't become uncircumcised. If you're not circumcised, then get circumcised. Because there is definitely a Jewish contingent that he is writing to um, in Ephesus here and in Corinth. As well, and we'll look at that in a little more depth. So he says here, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. So this is a surprise that somehow you could speak to Gentiles about being a member of the bride of Christ without going through all of the Judaistic inauguration to be to join the nation of, of Israel, like being circumcised and such. So that was a, a, a surprise. But he says, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband, just as Christ loves the church, and the church loves Christ. So that's, uh, let's see here. So this is probably the best place that lays out this comparison of the model of the Christian marriage, that it should model the love that Christ has for his church and that, and that the church has for Christ. That as in all things that Christians do, we should strive to be an excellent example of other people that might see us as an example of, well, if, if Jesus was here, he would be doing the same thing. He would be acting the same way. He'd be saying the same stuff. That is in, in all things that we do, not just in marriage, but marriage has a, a special level of typography or illustration in that it so closely mirrors the relationship that he has for his church or his bride that 
uh, it's called to even a higher level of obedience. And so Paul lays that out here. Now, is it, as with all illustrations, is it absolutely perfect? If you take it to the nth degree, does it fall apart? Well, of course it does. So like, for example, myself as a man, I can't, I don't, I mean, I don't think about marrying another man. That's not, but in, in a sense, that is. I mean, I'm part of the bride of Christ, and we will be married to Christ, but it's not in the same sense. So it breaks down just like all analogies do. Um, Christ is, uh, the, the Passover was a type of our Christ, but not a perfect type. If you take it far enough, it doesn't. He wasn't less than a year old when he was killed. Um, they didn't cook him up and eat him after he died. A, a number of other things. So it's, it breaks down after a certain point. But clearly, there are illustrations here. And so some people kick against this being an illustration of Christ and the church because, well, yeah, but it, it's not in this sense and it's not in that sense. Well, no, it's not meant to be. So there's only... There, there is no way to, in earthly ways, perfectly typify heavenly things. It's not possible. They are perfect and pure, and no marriage is perfect and pure because it has, even if they're repentant, forgiven, spirit-filled individuals in it, they are still fallen, and they still have problems at time and fall short. But nonetheless, those should be, that the fact that that is true, no one should take in any realm as licensed. Oh, well, so God understands, so I just can take it easy. I don't have to work hard at this. No, it's going to be hard work. It's going to be. Everything that we do is going to be hard work. It's in this world doesn't want us to be that way. Our own flesh doesn't want us to be that way. All right, so now let's skip back into, so 1 Corinthians 7, verses 8 and 9. We're actually, we skipped over those essentially in the part one because they more deal with unmarried. So I'll read them here. Not a lot of exposition. They're pretty straightforward, and he covers these points in more detail later on. But he says here, I say, therefore, to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. So in other words, unmarried. Now, whether Paul was a widower or whether he had never been married, we talked about that last time. doesn't really matter. He's saying as I. But if they cannot contain, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. Now, some take, take this word burn to, talk, to mean the lake of fire, that, well, if you don't marry, then you'll end up being in the lake of fire. But that's not what it's talking about in your lusts, in your desires, and burning passion. It's very clear. And this, this is straightforward. And he covers this point again a little later in the letter. So we'll, we'll look at that principle in more depth later. But this does open up another place where people take issue with this, uh, this sentiment that Paul says, if you're not married, widows, if you're not married, then don't get married. Um, but if you can't, you know, if you if you have to get married, it's okay. But he's his first line of advice is don't get married. If you're not married, don't get married. So if we go to First Timothy chapter five, and we're going to read verses three through sixteen, and I've got the NLT translation actually that I'm going to use here because Paul seems to give completely different advice in this to Timothy here, and uh, Timothy is in Ephesus actually when he's receiving this letter, so not in Corinth. Um, but so let's just read through this and let's take a look that and we'll be able to easily reconcile the two together to see Paul is saying the same thing. He's just addressing it from a different point of view. So Paul starts off here in first Timothy three verses three through seven. Take care of any widow who has no one else to care for her. But if she has children or grandchildren, their first responsibility is to show godliness at home and repay their parents by caring of them, by taking care of them. This is something that pleases God. Now, a true widow, a woman who is truly alone in this world, has placed her hope in God. She prays, prays night and day, asking God for his help. But the widow who lives only for pleasure is spiritually dead, even while she lives. So give these instructions to the church so that no one will be open to criticism. So what's going on here is that, and we see in Acts chapter 6, for example, where the, the Grecian Jews were accusing the Jews in Jerusalem of not caring for the widows. Hey, look, you guys are out caring for your widows. You're not taking care of our widows. We read about that in Acts chapter 6. Um, and I don't have it on the screen here, but Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. It says here, And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Well, that's what this is talking about. So the church would take on responsibility to, 
to make sure that the widows had all the things they needed to be able to survive. Um, in this letter, and also in 2 Timothy, um, Paul talks about that the widows, these widows also would have a role in the church to be able to help the younger women, to teach them how to raise children. So they had, there was work they could also do in the church. There was a place for them in church, but the church would take care of them. So, right, yes, so. Um, so then the 12, so then the 12 called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, uh, it is not reasonable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look yet among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, who you may appoint over this business. And so we know Stephen was one of those seven that uh, was stoned for his testimony not too long after this. So this is, this is what's going on here. There are, in, in the congregations, they had, they had administration to the widows. They would take care of widows who had no one else to take care of them. But Paul goes on here to say, picking up in verses 8 through 10, But those who won't care for their relatives, especially those in their own household, have denied the true faith. Such people are worse than unbelievers. So if there, if, if, if there is a widow in the, in the number, in the congregation, and she has other family members that are in the congregation, and they claim to be Christians, and they are not taking care of their widow, then church discipline needs to kick in. And they need to start taking care of. That's what they're supposed to do. And ultimately, if they refuse, then they have essentially denied the faith. But we'll see that what Paul says that here a little later. So in that case there, then this would be a woman who had no one else to care for her because anyone who was supposed to care for her would have abandoned her. So Paul goes on to hear, so a widow that's put on the list for support must be a woman who is at least 60 years old and was faithful to her husband. She must be well respected by everyone because of the good she has done. Has she brought up her children well? Has she been kind to strangers and served other believers humbly? Has she helped those who are in trouble? Has she always been ready to do good? So obviously this isn't about people trying to freeload. This is real situations in real life where the church has a responsibility when other people are not available to fill that responsibility. Now, here's where it seems to conflict with 1 Corinthians, picking up in verses 11 through 13 here. Paul says the younger widows should not be on the list because their physical desires <coughs> will overpower their devotion to Christ <coughs> and they will want to remarry. So that's essentially what Paul was just saying. They're going to burn in their lust. So it's better not to burn, not to sit there. and Because there was... Obviously, some form of a pledge that was made if, if a widow was put on the list. Okay, so you, you make an agreement then. You have duties to fulfill for the church to care for certain things. And so if a, if a young widow or an old widow, but if a widow went on the list and agreed to these things and then later on it's like, well, no, I want to get married again or whatever, then they'd have to break their vow. So that's why Paul is cautioning uh, Timothy here. Don't let that happen. Don't. And, and it specifically says the younger widows, he says here, picking up, they, they would, then they would be guilty of breaking their previous pledge. And if they are on the list, but if they don't break the pledge and they're younger widows, then generally what happens is they'll learn to be lazy and will spend their time gossiping from house to house. So if, if they are young and, they're, and, and all their needs are taken care of, they got nothing else to do. So they're going to be lazy and they're going to you know, gossip and they're going to go house to house meddling in other people's business and talking about things they shouldn't. So that's why Paul is cautioning here, look, have them marry. And we'll see later where he says he gives that same advice in 1 Corinthians 7. So he's not conflicting here at all. He's not a schizophrenic. And he also, in these cases here, this isn't situational ethics. He's not like saying, well, it's, you know, here in Ephesus is different than it is in Corinth. Uh, so carrying on the last three verses of this chapter here, 14 through 16. So I advise these younger widows to marry again have children, take care of their own homes, that the enemy will not be able to say anything against them. For I'm afraid that some of them have already gone astray and now follow Satan. If a woman who is a believer has relatives or, or widows, she must take care of them and not put the responsibility on the church. Then the church can care for widows who are truly alone. 
And I thought I had the verse in here where Paul says, essentially, if one doesn't care for his widow, for the people in his family, he's worse than an infidel. Again, yeah. the church discipline thing. Okay. You know, so, okay, so yeah, verse 8, I must, so, oh, did I? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and I didn't, did I use the NLT because it doesn't use the word infidel in there. So, yeah, they have, have denied the true faith, it says here. So, in verse 8, yes. So, like, so I said, church discipline then would be an operative thing. If they truly say they're Christians. Now, if they're outside the church and they refuse to take care of a Christian widow, there's no recourse the church has against those outside the church. But then they're certainly responsible to take care of the widow because she has no one else to care for her. So that's the framework in 1 Timothy. We've covered a couple of things out of 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that already show that there is no conflict there. And as we get back in at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we'll see that there is no conflict whatsoever, that Paul is teaching the same principle to Timothy to pass on to the Ephesians as he is in Corinth. But if you run across people who say, what Paul in one place says, get married, another place says, don't get married, they even make that same accusation about him within chapter 7, where it's like, well, wait, one place he says get married, another place he says don't get married. We've talked about that, and we'll continue to talk about that. So going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we'll pick up now where we left off. We left off in verse 24, so we'll pick up on 25. So Paul says here, so now concerning, concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. So that's an interesting statement Paul says here. So some take that to say, well, this is just Paul's opinion, so you can take it or leave it. But that's not true whatsoever. Paul doesn't boldly come out. Actually, in 2 Corinthians, he gets to the point to, the, to them. He's like, hey, I'm an apostle. You guys need to listen to me. I'm an apostle of Christ. If you, if you disobey me, not, not on this subject of marriage, but on other subjects, because they had gotten so far to say, well, who's this Paul guy? He thinks he's a big shot. He's nobody. He's, you know, who is he? The same way they kicked against Moses uh, in the wilderness. It's like, well, who does he think he is? Well, he's the one that God chose. Well, Paul is the same. So even though Paul here doesn't have a verse from the law of Moses or from the prophets that he or the wisdom literature that he can pull forward and say, here's the principle that was clearly illustrated in time past that applies now, he's saying, look, I got the spirit. What I'm saying is essentially you should take it as from the Lord. Um. And this, is, this makes sense here. Actually, just in the chapter before, certainly God has ordained people in his church that have wisdom to be able to judge matters. So just the, the, the chapter before, different subject matter. But he says here, I speak to your shame. Is it that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. So Paul is saying, you guys should have people among, amongst you that are wise enough to be able to handle these disagreements. And we look back in the Old Testament, and we see that's very common. For example, in Exodus 18, um, where Moses was getting worn out. Everybody that was coming to him with every little issue, they didn't know how to, they didn't know how to settle and solve. And, and Moses' spirit-led father-in-law came to him and said, look, you're going to wear yourself out doing this. You can't carry this entire burden. You have to let other men do their share of the work. And so Moses said, okay. And so he's picked men who were proper godly men, and he, he gave them responsibility to hear all of the small matters, and only the big things would they take to Moses, for Moses to actually pass judgment. Um, Solomon is another example, and we'll get back to him a little later. But Solomon is another example where he was given great wisdom to judge amongst things, where there was no verse that you could just flip to and say, see, Right, yeah, and, and Brian mentions in, in uh, Romans where, where Paul says, I'm confident that you're able to admonish one another. If, you, if one of you has fallen short, I'm confident there's others that can admonish and correct as needed. So um, Solomon, you know, was, he was a wise, a wise man. You know, the whole cut the baby in half thing was, you know, and, and so even and in that case there, then the woman whose child it actually was, was willing to give her child up rather than have it die. So... Um, so, so God has, in each generation, given men 
the ability to judge these matters that aren't, there was no verse that Solomon could turn to and say, uh, it's this woman that's the mother of this child. These are, mad, these are real life matters that come up on a daily basis. Now there was subterfuge going on there. Obviously the one woman, you know, stole the baby and switched it out. And so, but nonetheless, God gives men and women the time, ability to discern between these things in daily life. And so that's why as I get into this, and I'll re I will reiterate this again, but as I get into this, that there are some pretty steadfast rules, but life is a messy thing. And so if you find yourself in any way seeming like, wow, this is untenable, or I don't know what to do here, don't certainly first and foremost pray. Search the scriptures if there's anything that applies directly to your situation. Absolutely do. But that doesn't always give us what we need to, how, how do I walk this out today? How do I apply this? And that's why God has equipped the church with wise people. Seek out godly counsel. Don't seek out foolish, worldly counsel. That movie Fireproof comes to mind all the time when I see that. When she's, you know, sitting there at the little nurse's station talking with all her friends, and they're all like, you know, yeah, and they're all, they're, they're all, they're all, encouraging her to continue to sin and to go down the wrong path. And it's easy to find that, and our heart wants that. So we always have to watch our own heart. Yes. So, yes, itching ears. So, um, so Paul, while he says here, I don't have a, I don't have a commandment from the Lord in regards to the, the virgins that he's going to lay out in these next verses. Um, he, he essentially says here, but you can take what I say here as the word of the Lord, because it's coming from somebody who is God's apostle. So I want to spend a little more time on this verse also, because this is another place where people take, and then they try to ignore the entire chapter, because as it says here, I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. And they assume that, okay, there must be some kind of, special circumstances going on in Corinth, you know, something, something unique, some kind of persecution or whatever, maybe, you know, maybe this has to do with Nero or whatever it might be. And so that what Paul advises in this chapter to the Corinthians has to be tempered by the fact that this was a temporary situation they were in and that his, his, his counsel here is not intended to be counsel for all Christians for all time. Okay, so and and so the word present distress, um, the the Greek word there that is translated as distress is uh, Strong's G three eighteen. It is ananke, um, and it actually appears one hundred and eighty four times in the New Testament. Uh, in most cases, it is not translated as distress, although it is sometimes. So we'll take a look at a couple examples here. But you can see on the screen that it is also translated as must needs of necessity or necessary need needeth or needful so let's take a look at some examples of this word used so here we see in uh luke chapter 21 verse 23 this is jesus and he said and this is talking about the tribulation time it seems so but woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days for there shall be great distress in the land and wrath upon this people so in this verse here the word distress does seem to refer to a, you know, not, not all time. This is a special, you know, event that this is going to happen, whether this is talking about uh, when Titus and the Romans came into Jerusalem or when it's talking about, it. nonetheless, it's a certain, it's not for all time. It's a, you know, specific time. So, but actually, if we see in Hebrews 7, 12, for example, where it's translated necessity for the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. So that's not a distress, like, oh, it's all, oh, it's horrible. It's a, it's a need. So there is a requirement. And so that's how it is applied there. Let's take a look at another time that Paul uses that same Greek word in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 4, where it's translated as necessities. So we see here in 2 Corinthians 6 4 but in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of god in much patience in afflictions in necessities which is the same greek word that's translated as distress in the verse above there in first corinthians 7 in distresses so there's another word that paul uses 
to talk about distress. And that is the Greek word 4730 there. And that actually more fits the actual, like a temporary thing like this calamity or anguish or distress. So that could be a temporary thing. Though Paul did not use that word in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 26. He used the more general word of necessity, need. And that same Greek word that's um, used, translated here as distresses is used in a few other places. I won't read all of them, but it's in Romans 2, 9 for your notes there. So Romans 2, 9, Romans 8, 35, and 2 Corinthians 12, 10. And I'll read that verse actually. So 2 Corinthians 12, 10, therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches, in necessities, which is the 726 word, in persecutions, in distresses. So Paul uses both in necessities and in distresses, and distresses is this word here, the second word. So Paul knew the word, and he didn't use it in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So there is no context to assume that, and we'll even see a verse a little later that makes it even more clear, um, to assume that there was some special circumstance that was going on in, in Corinth that Paul was addressing so that you could essentially say, well, that's not going on now, so we could ignore everything Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. There's no context for that whatsoever. So if somebody's trying to pull that, they're trying to pull a fast one. That's why, as I said, I'm trying to address some of the but what abouts as you begin to dig into these and try to apply them in your life in real situations, these but what abouts are likely to come up. So I'm trying to address them now, but that's why I want to do the review at the end, you know, next week so that we can kind of summarize all the high level points and principles that Paul actually is talking about here. Because Paul in this letter is not talking about the finer nuances of Greek syntax and grammar. That certainly is not his point or the principle that he's trying to get across here. So, so carrying on, 26b through verse 28, Paul says here, I say that it is a good, it is good for a man so to be. And I put here, remain as he is. That's what Paul means here. And then he says, are you bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loose. And if you're loose from a wife, Seek not a wife. But if you marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Now, he'll put some context into that in a little later here. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. So he says here, trouble in the flesh. And so Paul is not speaking ill of marriage whatsoever. Not a, he's not saying, oh, man, marriage is the worst. It's like he's not like an Archie Bunker. Or uh, he's not at all talking evil about marriage here, but he's just making it clear. It's like, look, there times are tough. Things are difficult. So consider if you're not married, consider before you get married because it comes along with a cost and you should count that cost. He goes on in verses, so that same idea, he illustrates time and time again here. In verses 29 through 31 here, he says, but this I say, brethren, the time is short. So now if in verse 26, he meant the present distress was something temporary, then the time is short here, he would say, and this present distress is about to end, so then everything will go back to normal. No, he doesn't. What does he mean the time is short? Well, at the end of the very thing, this world passes away. Well, that's true of us today, too. The time is short. This world is passing away. So Paul's um, guidance and counsel here and command in these verses is intended for all Christians for all time. It was not intended for a certain specific situation in Corinth for a certain time. So he, he, he carries that same principle that he just stated in the verse before. Um, are you bound on no wife? Seek not to be loosed. If you're loose from a wife, seek not a wife. He says, but if you get married, all right. But if you do, be this way. They that have wives as though they had none. They that weep as though they wept not. They that rejoice as they rejoice not. They that possessed as though they possessed not. And they that use this world as not abusing it. 
for the fashion of this world passes away. So Paul is laying out some principles here. Look, okay, so um, if you have a wife, be as if you don't have one in the sense that don't let your concern override your duty to God. That in time past, and, and, and America is a perfect example of that. America has been the, the, the easy believism nation. We've been like, we were way better at it than Israel ever was. So where it's like you can just kind of coast through and you can do, you know, you can claim stuff, but it doesn't really have any effect on your life whatsoever. So realize that if you are married, if you have a wife, then, or, or wives, if you have a husband, live as if you don't in every opportunity to serve the Lord. That doesn't mean that then you can just tell your spouse, oh, forget it, I'm out of here. I'm going to serve the Lord. But at the same time, both should realize times are tough. We're in a war. The fashion of this world is passing away. Time is short. Our own individual salvation is on the line. The salvation of those that we love is on the line, and we can play a part in helping them live up to what their calling is. And the salvation of those who have not yet heard his voice is on the line, and we've been given an opportunity to play a role in that as well. So these other ones are less convoluted per se. So um, they that weep as though they wept not. So don't let your, your weeping drag you down so low that you can't do what God would have you do. And the converse, if you rejoice, as though you rejoice not. Don't let being so happy lull you into a, you know, a, a state of malaise where it's like, ooh, I'm just really doing good and floating around. Don't let that pull you into a state where you are not focused and obedient to what God would have you do. As those that buy, as though they possess not, doesn't mean you can't lock your front door, but ultimately, real, don't go to bed. If you're going to bed at night, worrying about somebody breaking in your house and stealing your stuff, you're out of order. That's not good. Right. Don't let your possessions possess you, yes. Don't. Um, and this last one, and they that use this world as not abusing it. So that one there confused me a little, but actually this is just more talking about um, if there's anything in the world that you your daily life is involved with that is necessary for you to be involved with that's fine as long as it's not sin of course but don't let it control you don't let it so this things that could fall in this category would be a job for example a job would be a great example of this of this verse so if you're using the world if you go out on a daily basis and and do work um that's good we're supposed to work we gotta we gotta support our families we gotta have money to buy um, people a sandwich if they need it, whatever it might be, but don't let that consume you. So if you find you, your thoughts and your hours and times wild away so much on work, for example, there's something out of order. Don't let that happen. Uh, other things could be, you know, we, we're great at justifying uh, what we think, well, I, I, I need this so that I can do what God would have me do. So an example is, so we make use of the internet to be able to broadcast the sermons i think is a wonderful blessing but if something came along where ultimately our, our our obedience to god made it that we couldn't use the internet for whatever reason then we should not for a second bemoan that oh man it was just so much better when we had the internet and it's not so that's that's another that could be another example whatever it might be that you are holding on to that this world has to offer and you think somehow well, if I don't have this thing, then I can't do whatever. You're out of order. And that's the point he's making. Um, yeah, so don't let any of these things inordinately prevent you from do everything as unto the Lord. Right. Yes. So this is an important point because he, he does example after example after example after example. He's trying to drive it home. Because that's, that's the main principle that he's putting forth here. It's like, look, time is short. The present distress, we have to, our mindset should be aligned with the knowledge that this world is dying and passing away. And this world has nothing to offer but death. 
He is the way, the truth, and the life. And if we will turn to him and obey him, then we can be happy in this life and live in hope of the next life. It doesn't mean that we can't enjoy this world. Absolutely, he gave us everything under the sun to enjoy, but not to have power over us. And in fact, Paul here in just the chapter before, in chapter 6, verse 12, he says here, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. So just because you can do a thing doesn't mean you should do a thing. And even if you are doing a thing that you can do, don't let it have power over you. And if certainly you're doing something you shouldn't be doing, stop doing it. That goes without saying. Paul doesn't even mention that because that's like, if you don't understand that as a Christian, there's other issues that need to be addressed. Paul, or uh, James here, again, the same, he, he gives the same idea. You adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And when, when he says friend of the world, that means that we have inordinately attached ourselves to some aspect of the world that takes away our ability to serve God. And so he goes in and explains how that applies to his counsel for marriage for those who are unmarried. He's in verses 32 and 33 here. He says, but I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried care for, cares for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married cares for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. Now again, Paul's not making, he, if you take it just at, on a literal level, Paul makes marriage sound like it's the worst thing you would ever even consider. Why would you ever want to get married? Paul is not saying that whatsoever, not for a second. But he is, he is elevating the responsibility of marriage. If you want to get married, that's fine, but just realize that's what's going to happen. Most people get married. God gave marriage to mankind as a blessing. Marriage is good in the proper context. But marriage brings along with it responsibilities. So that, that the amount of effort and responsibility that you then have to dedicate to your marriage, you cannot dedicate to him anymore. Now, he knew that when he created marriage, and he still created marriage, and he blessed us with it, so don't. And then going on, the same principle about applied to the women here. And there is a difference also between a wife or a married woman and a virgin. The unmarried woman cares for the things of the Lord that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married cares for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. Now I want you to make notice here. We're going to talk about this in a couple verses in another verse, but take notice here that he uses the two words, wife and virgin. So obviously virgin here is an unmarried woman. So we, we understand that even in today's uh, language, the word virgin means a person who has not had sexual intimacy with anyone else. I mean, that's, that's what a virgin is. Now, there may be other implications. Generally, that would mean that they are not married because people who are married should not be virgins. I mean, that's part of marriage, so. But it's not, it isn't, it, it isn't, it wasn't any different back in the day that Paul was writing than it is now. That people were, God's plan was that a man and a woman would stay a virgin until they are married, and then they would no longer be virgins. They would come together and they would become one flesh. Picking up in verse 35, because so Paul cautions here. He says, so I don't, I'm not trying to put a burden on you. So he says here, but I speak this for your profit, not that I cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely and that ye may attend upon the Lord without distraction. So if it is within you to not be married, don't get married just because that's what people do. That's just because it seems like a novel thing to do or it might be fun to have somebody on the weekends to talk to or when I come home from work at night and, and I just want to, you know, unload or whatever, don't realize there, there, are, there are responsibilities that come along with marriage. 
there are blessings as well. There are many blessings with marriage too. So again, Paul is talking more from the point of responsibility um, that would detract from our time and mental and emotional effort to serve the Lord here in regards to marriage. But marriage has many blessings as well. Um, first and foremost, it is a picture of how Christ loves his church and his church loves Christ. And you get to live that out. Single people don't get to do that. So... Right. Yeah. So that's, yeah, like Brian gave the example. So not in the realm of marriage, but the same idea. So a, a full time pastor, someone who can dedicate all the hours of their day to study of the word, application of the word, exegesis of the word, ex, you know, and expounding of it, as opposed to somebody who works, you know, during the week, right, you know, 40 hour, 50, 60 hour travel, you know, hours a week, then they don't have as much time to dedicate to that. So, right, to care for the Lord. Even though in their job, they certainly should be doing all as unto the Lord. It's, no, it's not like, oh, now I have all this time where I'm not doing nothing for God. No, that's not true. So, all unto the Lord, that's right. Yes, correct. And so along that line here, a couple more verses out of 1 Corinthians 10, verses 23. For all things are lawful to me. This is similar to what he stated before. All things are lawful to me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. So again, it's not. So consider before you just do something, is this for the greater good? Is this the right thing to do, the best thing to do? This is what God would have me do. Now, there's a lot of things in life where you can't really determine if this, well, is this the best thing? Should I get a red shirt or a blue shirt? Or, you know, that's pretty trivial. There can be things that are actually much more significant in life that really don't have, seem to have, well, this one is the more holy, proper, godly thing to do than this thing here. So if there is something that is clearly, this is what God would have me do, then you should do that in all cases without exception. But there are many things in life where it's difficult to discern. And so in those things, if it truly is a neutral thing, God has given us the ability to follow our own desires. And this is what I would like. I want a blue shirt. I always want a blue shirt. I'm going to get me a blue shirt. So that's okay. God, if that's my desire and it's not against his, then it's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Brian is mentioning here again, this is another instance in this letter where since we don't know what specific questions they asked or what information Paul had that he was responding to, that likely in this case here, the context was they were saying, well, all things are lawful. You said that, Paul, yourself. You taught us that when you were here, all things are lawful. And so he's countering back, yeah, but not all things are expedient. And then there are all things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. So just because you can do a thing doesn't mean you should do a thing. And then just a few verses later, wherefore, therefore, ye eat or drink or whatsoever you do, and whatsoever you do in anything, do all to the glory of God. Everything. Let all things be done unto edifying. That's his theme, especially in 1 Corinthians here. He talks about that a lot. All things. So that's Paul's, Paul's context there for verse 35. We'll go back to that real quick here. So because he laid out some hard things. I mean, the, the idea to tell somebody who either has never been married or is young and finds herself without a spouse and is eligible to remarry, to tell them, no, don't get married, that's, that's a tough thing to say. And Paul understands that. And so that's why he always tempers it with, but if you want to, you haven't sinned, if you go ahead and marry. But don't just automatically go get married again just because you think that's what's supposed to happen. And remember we talked in the last part, um, especially in Jewish culture, the idea is a man's got to be, if a man ain't married, there's something wrong with him. I mean, you know, that's so, and that's not true. So, 
I have several slides here about this next set of verses going into the Greek and such. And I think I'm just going to, I'll leave the slides in there, but I'm not going to dig into them real deep. I'm just going to give the general principles here. And then uh, if you want to dig into them a little more, please feel free. So this next set of verses, verse 36 through 38, let me read them, read them here on the, uh, on the screen here. So this is King James. But if any man think that he behaves himself uncomely toward his virgin, that she passes the flower of her age and need so require, let him do what he will, he sins not. Let them marry. Now, this is worded. This, I mean, who's who's the who are the players here? <laughs> who's what? So what is this talking about a father toward his unmarried daughter? But then what's this about let them marry? Well, certainly Paul's not saying a father and a daughter should marry. So what's who who are the players here? So is this a a fiance and his and his betrothed, you know, that a male, you know, a male and his betrothed, is that what it's talking about? Well, there's Greek context here that doesn't fit that either. So if we read on, so nevertheless, he that stands fat, steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, but has power over his own will and has so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin does well. So that he that giveth her in marriage does well, but he that gives her not in marriage does better. So that, that phrase there at the end, gives her in marriage um, and gives her not in marriage, uh, is a Greek word that's only used five times in, in the scripture. And it seems quite clear that that is talking about the, the act of a woman being given to a man by her father in marriage. So I, I do have a slide. So like I said, I don't want to, so let me, like I said, I don't want to, I, I, yeah, yeah, I will. So I, and, and I'll leave them in here. So um, let me actually first, so the, let me, there's two, there's two words in here. First, the word virgin that's here. So let me read, let me read a, a modern, the NLT rendering of this set of verses, and then we'll, we'll compare the two real quick. So here's the NLT, the way the NLT, oh, um, oh. so here's the NLT version of these verses. So, but if a man thinks he's treating his fiance improperly, so they change virgin to fiance here, um, and will inevitably give in to his passion, let him marry as, she wish, as he wishes, it is not a sin. But if he has dis, uh, decided firmly not to marry, and there is no urgency, and he can control his passion, he does well not to marry. So the person who marries his fiance does well, and the person who doesn't marry does even better. So the new, so the NLT, and then several of the other modern translations have essentially changed the word virgin into fiance, and given in marriage into marry or marries. Okay, so that's what they have done. So and. So there, there's most of the modern translations uh, approach this verse this way. However, they, they, the, the basic, the text behind their translation is unchanged. So many of the modern translations say, but well, we have newer and better texts and, and our texts, the Greek texts don't say the same thing that the Masoretic texts or that the Latin Vulgate that the King James came from said. And so that's why we're translating it different because we have a better text. But in this case here, none of them claim that they have a different text. They all have this, the, the original Greek is the same original Greek for all of the translations. So they just did it because they think that the other way it doesn't make sense. If this is talking about a father and a daughter, that there's conflicts and it doesn't make sense. So they have changed these, the fiance, um, virgin to fiance and marries to marry. So I guess I'm going this way. So let's just stick this down this road here. So um, I'm just going to go into depth a little more here. So this is, a, again, so I, I've, I've highlighted the ver words that are switched out, virgin and giveth her in marriage. So let's take a look at the word virgin first. So as I said, uh, we all understand the basic text. A virgin means someone who has not had sexual, physical intimacy. I mean, it's male or female, it can be. Now, generally in scripture, it's usually talking about a female, but not always. We'll take a look at a verse, so. Um, so here, this is the Greek word virgin that's uh, from 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 36 to 38, that is used. Uh, it's used 14 times in, in the New Testament. And again, the modern translations that translate this fiancé, it's still the same Greek word they translate it from. They don't give any real reason why they do. So, um, so here, here's an example of where the, another example of where this word is used. 
So Matthew 25, verse 1, for example. So here, um, then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. So their contention is the word virgin has to do with the bridegroom. So this is a, a fiancé. So they would change this. to, and, and in the context of this verse, there's really nothing in this verse that you could say, well, no, that, that doesn't make sense in the context of this verse. So this one would be tough to use for that. But there's other verses. The context makes it clear. So here's another place where that same Greek word is used, and it's translated as virgin in both the new translations, although some would translate it as maiden instead of virgin, and in the older translations like the New King James. So Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. So behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So here, if virgin means someone who, a fiancé, if virgin means a fiancé, what would be miraculous about that? I mean, not that that's a bad thing if, if someone who's not married yet gets pregnant, but what's miraculous about a fiancé getting pregnant? I mean, that's not, I'm sure that it's happened many times before this verse was written, and it's happened many times since, either, either by the man that she's betrothed to, and they just couldn't contain until the wedding date and she got pregnant, or some other man. But nonetheless, what would be miraculous about this if this is a fiancé? There would be nothing miraculous about it. But if the word virgin here means a woman who has not had sexual intimacy with a man has become pregnant, then that is miraculous. So to try to, to, try to shoehorn fiancé into here would make no sense. It would make this worthless. So why are you even telling me that? What's the, <laughs> so, um, and then here's another case where um, virgin actually is applied to men in Revelation 14, verse 4. And it's the same Greek word. This is talking about 144,000, and these are men. And so these are they which are not defiled with women, which means essentially they haven't had physical intimacy with women. doesn't mean women are defiling in themselves. Don't misunderstand. For they are virgins. So here the word virgin, the same Greek word, actually is used to apply to men. And how does it apply to them? Does it mean that they're fiancés? No, it means that they have not had physical sexual intimacy. That's what, so, so the word, to take the word virgin and just change it to fiancé because you can't wrap your mind around how it can't be that is spurious. So that's the first thing. So I think they're using the word fiancé is inappropriate. There's no textual context for it. There's no reason to do it. So the second thing is the giveth her in marriage. So those are the second verses. They've changed those to marry. So let's, or marries. So let's take a look at the Greek word that's behind that. It's uh, ekamizo. It's uh, Strong's 1547. And it's translated given marriage. And there's only five times in, uh, in the text. And again, the modern translations, the text behind them is the same Greek, so it's not different. So let's take a look at... Let's see here I'm I mean, I have a couple examples here of where that's used. So we see here in Matthew 22, 30. So it's used five times total, two times just in the verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And then here's a couple more. Um, so here we use, see, Matthew 22, 30. Jesus says here, For in the re resurrection they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. So if, if this Greek word means marry, then this verse would say, for, the re for in the resurrection they neither marry nor are married. So I, I guess it could, but it seems like this word is a, a, a feminine sense of the act of a woman being married. So the word, the word married, there's a completely different Greek word, can apply to both men or women. The state, you know, being in a marriage. But this is talking about the act of becoming married. That's what Jesus is talking about here. They're not going to marry and they're not given in marriage. And then in, in Luke 17, 27. Oops. 
they did eat, they drank, they married wives, and they were given in marriage. So that's even a little clearer. It's like talking about the men married wives and the women were given in marriage. So it's not. And who were they given by? Their fathers. I mean, it's not. They weren't given by just some guy off the street. And they weren't given by their fiancé. The fiancé, the, the, the man they marry, isn't the one that gives them in marriage. He's the one that takes them in marriage. So until the day that Noah entered in the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. And the only other place that this word appears other than in 1 Corinthians 7 is in Matthew 24, 38, which essentially says the same thing as Luke 17, 27. Um, so there's different there's completely different words for if they're just saying married there. So when they translate that in from given in marriage to marry and virgin into fiance, there's no context for that. Now I will confess that up until a couple weeks ago, I was pretty firmly in the fiance camp. I had never really vetted these verses out. I never really had a reason to dig deeply into them. And the way that it's worded in the King James at first verse it's like, well, wait, what? The father's going to marry his daughter? That makes no sense. And then, and, and if you don't understand the context of what's being said, it seems actually not to make sense in the flow of what Paul is talking about in the rest of the verses. So, so I, like I said, I was coming at this, I was pretty squarely in the fiancé camp. I thought the modern translations kind of had it right, and the older ones were just, they weren't wrong, but they were just translated clunkily, you know, older English, and so... I discovered that I was incorrect um, in studying through it. So there are several translations, including modern ones, that translate it the way the King James does, but I think it's worded a little more clearly to understand how this could be a father and a daughter, how those verses that are there. So I have the uh, God's Word translation here. It's not the only one that translates it. From that point of view so so this essentially agrees with the king james translation it just words it in a way that's a little bit easier to understand so let's just take a look at what it says here so here's first corinthians chapter 7 verse 36 through 38 out of the god's word translation so no father would want to do the wrong thing when his virgin daughter is old enough to get married if she wants to get married he isn't sinning by letting her get married however a father may have come to a decision about his daughter if his decision is to keep her at home because she doesn't want to get married, that's fine. So it's fine for a father to give his daughter in marriage, but the father who doesn't give his daughter in marriage does even better. So there's a couple of things about this uh, that, so I think this better captures what the text says, what the Greek says, what the, what the King James says, but it's worded a little better. Now, I have, you'll notice I have a couple of phrases in here underlined. Because I think that actually those aren't, well, they, so they aren't directly in the text. And I don't think that the context of the text actually bears out the fact that those are in there. So if we think about the time, what the world was like then, I mean, that's arranged marriages were the way it was. Fathers were the head of the household and they, and they gave their daughters away. Now, a lot of times that marriage would be arranged when they were little children. I mean, so it would be, you know, a long time. It would be around a long time. So from that point of view, um, a father did not really need to consider his daughter's desires, whether she wanted to get married to this guy or not. Now, a loving father, if the guy turned out to be an absolute cad, would, I'm sure, step in and, and, and do something about it. But there was actually no requirement for that. I mean, the, and, and it was expected that fathers would give their daughters away in marriage. I mean, that's just what was the normal thing that was done. Not, it was done in Jewish culture. It was done in Roman culture. It was done in the world, pretty much. That's the way it, it was. Um, we don't generally do it that way today. We look down our nose at that arranged marriage idea. And certainly there were flaws in the whole process. But I will also say that we haven't exactly done a stellar job in doing marriages nowadays either. So before we just automatically guffaw at this and say, well, man, what primitive jerks they were, um, we should take a step back and earnestly look. But So from that context, I think that if she wants to get married or because she doesn't want to get married, that, that could be for a father if he wanted to consider those things. I think more the context here is that if 
The father, of course, is assumed that it would be a Christian father. Paul wouldn't even be addressing this situation if the father was not a Christian. And the daughter, certainly the father would not want to marry the daughter off into a non-Christian family, just like back in the day, they, you know, Israel wasn't supposed to marry their daughters off to the other nations or give their, you know, or, or have their sons take their other nations' daughters under them. We'll look at that a little bit here. Um, in the same fashion here, I think that that's what Paul is doing here. He's saying, look, okay, so, you know, you were, you made this agreement way back when they were, you know, six months old or whatever, and now you become a Christian, or maybe even you were a Christian when you made that agreement, and now you know better, and it's like, well, this guy, you know, that she's betrothed to, this thing isn't going to be good. And and so Paul is saying here, essentially, in that circumstance, you, Father, can break the betrothal contract that you made, and you can keep your daughter and not marry her off. Now, Paul does not address if then you can find another husband for her and have her get married to him or not, and he doesn't cover that situation. Um, but I believe that's the context of what, and so that's why I think this, this translation properly ca uh, captures Paul's intent of what he was writing, with the exception that I think that the if she wants to get married and because she doesn't want to get married was put in there by the translators because they thought it was too hard otherwise. And certainly a father could consider those things if he wanted to. That would be, you know, up to the father. But I would say in most cases, um, and especially in arranged marriages, there would probably be a whole lot of hesitancy in most cases by the daughters of like, well, I don't know, dad, I don't want to. I mean, that happens now with willing marriages. I and mean, Hannah, when she, she was like concerned about, oh, I got to go live somewhere else. I'm not going to live with you guys Some fears, reservations there on the daughter's part does not mean that the father should say, okay, let's call it off. No, that's not what it is. So what, what the specific, again, with so many of these things, to actually apply this in a godly manner would require individual, you know, counseling, talking it through with the wise men. To be determined, this is the judgment. This is how God would have this situation handled. Think of Jephthah's daughter, for example. So he is he he vowed unknowingly, but he made a vow essentially that I'm not going to get my daughter marriage. She is going to remain a virgin for her entire life. And she honored that vow. She was distressed about it somewhat. She mourned, but nonetheless, she honored it. She honored that vow. So that's a case where this would fall here. So it's like. Whatever reason you don't give your marriage, you have not sinned. So, so the reason Paul would have to address this is because the norm was, hey, you made an agreement. But Paul does not want fathers to feel forced to marry their daughters off to non-believers or unbelievers. Not at all. Not for a second. Right. So this is a situation where Paul addresses it. So I believe that's why it's there, and that's what he's saying. All right, so now the last batch here, the last couple verses. So verses 39 and 40. So here Paul, so in verse 25, he started off with, as to virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, but I believe I have good, godly, wise counsel that you should heed. So now he's summing this up, and so he comes back around. So... Now with the widow. So the wife is bound to the by law as long as her husband lives. But if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. But she is happier if she so abide after my judgment. And I think also that I have the Spirit of God. And so I'll cover this last part first, and then we'll get into the only in the Lord. So this here, Paul kind of closes this section from 25 to 40 out again with, I think also that I have the Spirit of God. So he started off with, look, I don't have a specific set of verses I can give you, but I have godly principles. God has given me wisdom as his apostle. Here is my counsel in these situations. And so he kind of wraps it up. He's like, hey, I think I have the Spirit of the Lord. So this isn't just like something that I think is good. Because people could accuse Paul of that. Well, yeah, of course you don't. You think people shouldn't be married, Paul, because you're not married. So of course you're going to think that. And Paul is essentially 
cutting those people off at the knees. No, that is an invalid objection. Now, this verse here, this this end of this for, uh, verse thirty nine here, only in the Lord. So uh, that means a Christian. Only in the Lord means a Christian. That's not. That's you just read all over Scripture. That that phrase is all over. So only in the Lord. That's a Christian. Paul is talking about a Christian. There's no other. There's no other way to look at that. Um, but Paul doesn't make that caveat in other in, in several other places in this chapter where he says, let them marry here, let them marry, you know, let them marry. He doesn't say, let them marry only in the Lord, let them marry only in the Lord. I believe that Paul makes this not, it's not because they shouldn't marry an unbeliever. I think that wasn't even in Paul's mind. The idea that a Christian would marry an unbeliever is like not even something. I mean, he doesn't address don't men don't marry men, women don't marry women, because he wouldn't even consider that. I mean, he wouldn't even think Christians would do that. And so in the same sense, I, I think that he he's not thinking that what I believe what he's saying here, only in the Lord, is to correct some of those who would hold that the Jews could only marry other Jews. And that's not true. A Jew believer can marry a Gentile believer. That's that's completely acceptable within God's purview. That a Jew doesn't have to marry a Jew. An Israelite doesn't have to marry an Israelite. An Israelite can marry a Gentile, but they all have to be believers. So I think that that really is the context that Paul is making this only in the Lord, so that 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 that, that ethnic idea that that the Israelites thought, well, no, you're you're you were born in Greece. Your your parent is you know who knows whatever, not related to Abraham at all. I can't marry you. You're dirty. I don't care if you're a believer. I don't care if you converted. So Paul is addressing that idea there, I believe. Because otherwise, this only in the Lord would be scattered throughout the entire thing. I think that he's just making a point here. Now, since we open that can of worms about only in the Lord and only marrying other Christians as being just a, a basic assumption Paul would make that he wouldn't even consider that because his, his whole framework in, okay, so if you're married and then one converts and now you're married to an unbeliever, then that's, you know, the whole context would not even make any sense if, if that was going on, that believers were marrying unbelievers and that was a common thing or even an expected thing. He would address it more specifically. So it's just, a, it's understood, assumed, Paul just assumed that that wouldn't be happening. They wouldn't do that. So let's take a look here at why. Paul would assume that. So here, let's read out of 1 Kings chapter 11. Let's read verses 1 through 4. But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said, uh, said unto the children of Israel, ye shall not go into them, Neither shall you come in, they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. So Solomon was a pretty wise guy. I mean, he was the cut the baby in half guy. People came from all over the world, essentially, to hear his wisdom. The Queen of Sheba, when she came, was so amazed by the wisdom that God, had, and, and he gave credit to God. He, he made no bones about it. He said, God has given me this wisdom. He asked God for wisdom. And yet, Solomon here did that which he shouldn't. Now we go on and read, and it says, here's the issue. Solomon clave unto these in love. So God doesn't even chide Solomon here for having 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. He doesn't even mention that, what's up with that? He mentions the fact that they were all uh, worshipped other gods. And the fact that, Solomon, you clave, you, you entangled your heartstrings with them. You clave unto these in love, and as a result, they turned away your heart. That was the issue. That's what God accused, here through 1 Kings, Solomon of doing. Certainly he was wrong in having 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines. But that's like, in, in the scale of things here, 
that's like, all right, we're not even going to talk about that. We got much more important things to talk about. Much more important things. You married all these women that worship pagan gods, and you entangled your heartstrings with them. And as a result, they pulled you away, which is what I told you would happen if you did this. Surprise, surprise, it happened. Big mystery. No, it's not. For it came to pass when Solomon was old that his wife turned away his heart unto other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. And we know David had his issues with women. So David wasn't sinless, but David, in all cases where he did sin, repented of that sin. He confessed that it was sin, that it was wrong, and he repented of it. Solomon did not. He continued to build Asheroth poles and all kinds of high places and stuff for all of these pagan gods that his wife wanted him to. Now, a lot of these wives were probably captured in war and battle, and they didn't necessarily seek out Solomon to marry him, but nonetheless, he married them. So they may not have even had a conspiracy in their mind to, well, let's pull him away like Delilah did with Samson. She seemed to want to make him fall. They may not have want, they may not have intentionally, you know, wanted to pull him away from his God, but that's just what happens. They were just busy worshiping their gods, and Solomon loved them and he wanted to make them happy. And so he did what made him happy. Wrong, Solomon. Wrong. So do we really think that we are wiser than Solomon or wiser than God? Certainly not. This is sound counsel that God has given. There are many places. Um, let's see here. Again, I, I didn't. Um, I think the point is quite clear, and Paul himself did not find it necessary to belabor the point. But I just want to make a few points here about this, this idea. It's not, it's not that God does not hate unbelievers. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him shall be saved, shall receive eternal life. That's, you know, so, so, so he does not hate, but if they reject him, then they will not be saved. And just by nature of not leaning towards him and receiving his gift and his spirit, they are going to have little Ashtaroth poles that they need to have built and accepted and agreed upon by those whose hearts are clave to them. That's just the way, it, whether it's their intention or not, whether they have some nefarious plot in their mind to overthrow the Christian or not is irrelevant. Second Corinthians chapter six, verses 16 or 14 through 18. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. So while these verses aren't necessarily specifically about marriage, they apply in all things. I mean, they can apply about things in business. So in the, the example we just read in 1 Kings, Solomon claved to them in love. In reality, if, if a company you work for isn't, isn't staffed and owned and controlled 100% by Christians and Christian principles, then everything that they do, product they produce or whatever, is only used for Christian purposes, then what, are, are you can't work for that company? I mean, what about somebody who works for Walmart or for Jules, a local supermarket chain here in the area, or, what, or, or a company named Magnetrol that makes instrumentation that gets sold into, you know, in, into all parts of the country, including like China? for example, where they persecute Christians and things like this. That, so does that, is that unnecessary? So each one of us has to work that out, actually, in our own hearts, in our own salvation. So there are some things that are clear. So, for example, um, if I was a, a security guard at an abortion clinic, that's wrong. There is no, I can't imagine any circumstance where a Christian would knowingly do that job. 
That is not a job Christian should do. It should not be a bouncer inside of a, a strip club, you know. I mean, that's not, a Christian should never have that job. That's not, there are certain things that, you know, right. So, yes, right. Yeah, work in an adult video store, yes, renting them out. No. So there are things that it's not, absolutely. So nonetheless, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And so some of this Paul was addressing already, not in the sense of necessarily unbelievers, but just in the fact that if you are yoked to someone, and in marriage you are yoked to someone, you are, um, then that is going to require, that has responsibilities, and that is going to take away from your time and effort that you can place in exclusively dedicating to service to the Lord. So don't be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what, shall, what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? These are rhetorical questions. The answer is none. What communion has light with darkness? None. What accord has Christ with Belial? None. Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? None. Now, we all have jobs. Well, some of us, you know, we all interact with unbelievers to a certain extent or another. So Paul is not saying that we should entirely withdraw from the world. He covered that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I can mention that. It's like, we're not supposed to just go get our own little compound where we have no interaction with the world. Well, we are not supposed to cleave to the world in any way that would, and especially the world of unbelievers, that would take away from our ability to serve the Lord. Um, and what agreement has the temple of God with idols? None. And why? For you are the temple of the living God. And we're the temple of God individually, each believer. We're the temple of God and a representative of the temple of God as families and as the church. We are also the temple of God, his bride. So as I said, the, the idea of someone willingly marrying an unbeliever wasn't even really in Paul's mind. He addressed situations where someone who was already married and then they found themselves in a marriage after the fact with an unbeliever on how those things could be addressed. Uh, I think there's some assumptions made on those verses that both were, both were um, unbelievers when they got married and then one got converted. Paul doesn't say that. I think that's probably the main context and what he was talking about. But certainly that same context would apply to two people who were believers and got married. And then one fell away at some point in time. And so now the, un the believing spouse would find themselves in a marriage with unbelievers. And the third case, although certainly Paul is not giving any license or any encouragement at all, to the situation, but the third case could be where a believer very foolishly and sinfully married an unbeliever, and now they find themselves in this situation. That also would fit that. So Paul's Paul's guidance in those verses apply to those situations, regardless of what the the genesis of the relationship was. Um, and he gave clear advice: if the if the unbelieving spouse wants to stay, keep them, encourage them. Don't cleave to them in the things that take you away from God. Don't worship their gods. Don't build Asheroth poles for them. But don't divorce them either. God hates divorce. So the last couple verses in 1 Corinthians, or um, let's see, you know, we were so out of 2 Corinthians 6 um, are just actually quotes from, uh, from the Old Testament. So, and the, these are NLT, and so the NLT uses all capital letters when they when they have quotes from the Old Testament. So I'm not screaming at you here. So, but, uh, um, so as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, cut out, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. I will be your father. I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. So the main reason that uh, I read through these here is to show that while we are not under the old covenant. Certainly, Paul has no hesitation of using the laws that were laid out there and bringing those principles and applying them to how we live our lives as servants of Christ. So, because, because earlier I read out of Deuteronomy, and some might object, well, yeah, but that was to the nation of Israel. That doesn't apply to Christians. Well, in, in a technical sense, per, perhaps, but this, the principle obviously does, because read what Paul says, read what Jesus says, read what Peter says, read what James says, read what John says. So, yes, 
it does. So while while the fact that it was written in the law of Moses doesn't necessarily make it um, commanded to the New Testament, the New Covenant Christian, the principles that are inherent there obviously are, and this is one of the principles. Don't don't be marrying unbelievers. Don't don't mix with the world. Don't don't get into don't get into a business relationship with an unbeliever that's too deep. I mean, you got what is too deep? Well, that is a, a discussion for another time. Um, and, and it would be a one-on-one. -on -one. It would kind of be, we'd have to look at it. But but ultimately, the way too deep could be would be judged, must be judged, is does the requirements or responsibilities of this relationship take me away from serving God or or draw me towards and entice me towards doing that, which I know God does not want me to do. In those cases there, pass. Don't do it without exception and without regret. Um, so if a Christian is married a non-believer, they've sinned, period. Not only in the act of marriage, but in the sinful compromises and actions taken to get to the point of marriage. So what should be done? What should be done when we sin, when we do any sin? Well, we should repent and ask for forgiveness and strength to no longer commit the sin. So if someone found themselves in this situation, God hates divorce. So the repentance mean, doesn't mean, well, no, I just go get divorced. In fact, God doesn't want you to get divorced. First Corinthians 7, Paul makes it clear, look, you're in the marriage now. Stay in the marriage. As long as they're willing, stay in the marriage. And in fact, use it as an opportunity, since you got to make the best of where you're at, to glorify God in the heart of your spouse, of your non-believing spouse. Um, so at this point, um, as we read there, and, and so the ongoing battle um, faced for anyone that is married to a non-believer, but especially one who has in time past, as a Christian, engaged in um, willing compromise and agreement with things that are contrary to God, the battle faced will be to break the sinful mindset and pattern of compromises and actions that they were guilty of that justified the marriage in their mind in the first place. That that is going to be the battle that is going to have to be fought. That's a tough battle. Solomon did not do too well. Now, Scripture does not ultimately tell us what Solomon's fate will be. Will he be in the kingdom or not? That's up to God. Reading what he did, uh, I mean... God is merciful. We don't know what, how that all works out, but there is, there is not one example. There is not one example in Scripture where a man of God has married an unconverted, non-believing outsider, and it has gone well with them. Look at Samson and Delilah, for example, as a really good example. Now, we do see examples where Ruth, but she put her heart towards God. Rahab, obviously, at must at some point. Now we do have an example where God commanded Ho or Hosea to marry Gomer, and she was a harlot and a, and a, and a wicked woman, and she ran off on him, and he and he made her go chase her down and bring her back. But there's no evidence. There's no evidence that in anything evil, Hosea claved to her and sinned or compromised his faith whatsoever, and he was being obedient to God in what he was doing. God told him to do that. So, so if 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 someone if someone finds herself considering marrying an unbeliever and they believe that they're a Hosea, either a male or a female version of Hosea, then come talk because there's probably some deception going on there. I don't think that God is really doing that nowadays. So I can't imagine any situation in which um Paul would have considered, hey, go just, I know you're, whatever, for whatever reason, go marry an unbeliever. That's not, wasn't even in his mind. So I don't think he even addressed it. That's not, he just, he just, he addressed situations where a believer would find themselves in a situation based on prior acts, and now they were yoked to a non-believer. How to handle that, what to do. Um, and he gave some pretty wise counsel, I believe, there. Um, so while it may seem grim to be in a situation, any of those situations where a, a believer 
is yoked with an unbeliever, and especially think in the situation of where uh, they were both married as, as non-believers, and then one was converted, so they're a new believer. I mean, how much did you know, and how you know how well were you at at wielding the spirit in in your early days? You know, so that that's a tough road. But Paul encouraged. So there is hope. There's no license. There's no reason. So if if you have done something wrong, then first you need to confess it, and 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 that confession can be a testimony to others. Also, that like like look. Uh, so we were talking last week. So that um, one of the the couples here was, you know, they were married before they were in the Lord and they were up to stuff, whatever. I don't, I mean, I don't even really know any details, but just like most things in the world. So that's not the way to start a marriage off. Now, the fact that God has since then blessed them individually and by filling them with the spirit and encouraging them and guiding them. And he's blessed their marriage. And he certainly has blessed us with them and their marriage also, just because that's true doesn't mean that we should deny the fact of that this started off wrong. I mean, what about what about David and Bathsheba? So that that union ultimately led to the physical body and birth of our Messiah, Jesus Christ. So are we then because of the great results that came out of it to assume that the horrible adultery and murder that was the beginning of that that marriage that's okay? No, that was wrong. Not there's it was wrong, sin, evil, wicked. No, right. Yes, evil, wicked. Just because God forgave it, just because God blessed it, does not mean for a second that it wasn't wrong. And uh, there's no other example in Scripture where people got away with it like that. So don't think that God is mocked or God is fooled. Most cases, when people put themselves in these situations, it just gets worse. It doesn't have to. A living dog is better than a dead lion. As long as you're drawing breath, you can turn to him, and he will provide a way out. Remember Jesus' words to Peter here in Luke twenty two thirty two, 32, when Peter, uh, essentially, Peter thought he was wiser than God and Jesus. Jesus is essentially telling him, hey, I'm going to die. And Peter's like, no, that can't be. That's wrong. So Jesus rebukes him. But then he says, but I have prayed for you that your faith doesn't fail, and when you're converted, that you strengthen the brethren, that you use your wicked sin and unbelief in me right now, Peter, that you just expressed. Once you are converted and strengthened from that, that you use that to be able to strengthen the other brethren. Don't make excuse for it or anything. So, like I said, next week I'm going to do, uh, hopefully I'm going to keep it like the 15 minutes at the most but a brief summary of all of 1 Corinthians 7. But I do want to cover a couple, this is the last slide here, a couple high points of the of what we covered out of 1 Corinthians 7, part 2 here today. So just one slide here real quick, and then we will close out. So Paul advises the unmarried to stay married. Or to stay unmarried, yes. I had it typed Good. You're listening, and I'm testing. So um, the unmarried can marry. This is not a sin. And... And a little caveat here that Jewish believers can marry Gentile believers, misspelled believers. Um, and it must be to, but it must be to another Christian. Um, and then there will be fewer competing priorities for the unmarried as they strive to serve the Lord in all that they do. So that's why Paul advises to stay unmarried if you're not married. Or, and you can bear it. Um, and the fathers can break betrothal agreements that we talked about in, in verses 36 through 38. So I think those are the high points of, and I'm going to go into more detail about this, what we covered today. Um, but those are the high points of what we covered. So that ends the formal portion of the sermon. Now, I said last week that there would be uh, a Q, open to Q&A, and I asked people if they had any questions to send in. And so I actually, one came up here later that day last week that I'd like to address. And then I got another one via email that I'll go over real quick. I'll, these will be quick here. So, and then we'll close out unless somebody has something else. And, and if you do, actually, I might uh, um, I might table them until next week just because we're already running quite late. So the first question um, was raised around the table here, and uh, it seems that in the question of second or subsequent marriages, it wasn't entirely clear. There was time, there were some times apparently where it sounded like I was saying, well, no, you can't ever get married again, and sometimes where I said you could. So let me clarify
what Paul says here, what I believe the Lord says in regards to subsequent marriages is not necessarily second marriages because we read about the one example where the woman got married to seven, seven times and they were all valid marriages. So first and foremost, um, and we read about it in uh, Romans 7 verses, and I, I just you can write these down if you want, Romans 7 verses 2 and 3. Um, if your spouse dies, then you're free to marry again. So not if you murdered them. I don't know. That's a different thing. But if your spouse dies, you're free to marry. So that's one sort. So then, then that the next, the the second marriage after that would be a valid, proper marriage in God's eyes. It would be so. Uh, that's one situation where a remarriage. Now Deuteronomy 24 verses one through four. I won't read all of them. We covered that in the part, the previous part. Uh, but that's where Moses said that if he finds an uncleanness in her, if he doesn't have favor, that he can write her a bill of divorcement and she can go out of the house. Those verses also clearly say that she may go and be another man's wife. Another man's wife. Right. He gives a bill of divorcement, right. And it even goes on to say that he could actually divorce her later on. So that marriage, the second marriage, would require a divorce for it to end. So that is a valid marriage according to the law. And Jesus uh, um, also agreed, although he said, yeah, well, Moses did that because of hardness of heart. That wasn't, you don't, don't, that's an escape clause. Don't take that as license. But Jesus agreed, yes, that's valid. Um, and then in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse uh, 26 and 28, that we read here, um, is Paul says, Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. But if you marry, you have not sinned. So if you're loose from a wife, but if you marry, you have not sinned. Again, it's so those are some examples um, of where subsequent marriages can be valid. It is not license. It is not. If you are looking at this as if some license, Paul, remember Paul's strong godly counsel is, look, it, it's best if you don't get married again. So don't, don't just think it's like life is a marriage factory and you can, don't. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And it wants what it wants. Don't let, don't, if, if you find yourself considering these things or in situations where you think they apply, godly counsel is absolutely necessary. And I don't mean by going and looking at videos on the internet. So the second question was emailed in from Corey Bailey. And uh, so I think this was just a matter of my misspeaking so her question was in part one did i say that the people that people were not intended to be married and if so what was the intention for populating the earth so i believe that what she's referring to is um around slide 11 when i was talking about luke 20 verses 33 through 35 without saying that god gave man marriage but it wasn't because that's not the ultimate goal that God has for man to be married. The ultimate goal that God has for man is that he would dwell with, that we would dwell with him forever in eternity in, in his kingdom. There are many things that go on here. This, that, and so he, in the beginning, he made them male and female. We read this in Genesis chapter one. It says um, that he made him in our, we, he made man in our images, male and female made he them. Um, and then in Genesis 2, verses 20 through 24, it says here, God gave names to all cattle and all fowl in the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found and help meat for him. So all the other animals, they had a way to reproduce. Now, animals don't get married. Animals and humans are not. Animals don't get married. Even though some animals may seem to have affection towards other animals, some do, some don't, you know. Some seem to mate for life, you know, that they will, they don't, Others not. Most animals don't. Most animals play the field. They just, you know, want to do whatever. I mean, that's the way they're animals. They don't get married. They don't. It's not animals don't get married. Marriage is something that God gave specifically to mankind. And so when it says here that um, there was not found a help meet for him, this doesn't mean that God was all of a sudden surprised. and said, well, I didn't even think about that. I guess I got to get. No, it was always the plan. It was always the plan. So he made he made Adam a wife. But this was special. It wasn't the same thing. There's no, and he made her out of him. Whereas there's no evidence that he made any other female animal out of the male. He didn't make a female cow out of a male cow, out of a bull, or, you know, what I mean, or a doe out of a buck. You know, it doesn't, it's, he says, male and female created he them. 
So, but for man, for man, for humanity, he always intended that we would have marriage. But just remember that being married is just a temporal thing. It's just here on earth. We won't be married in the kingdom. That's not what he has planned for us. But so hopefully, um, Corey, it's a good question. I appreciate it. I apologize if I was somewhat confusing in the way I worded that. Uh, and I hope that answered your question. So as I said, uh, if you have any other questions, please send them in and I'll try to address them next week. And I will summarize the entire chapter and cover the main points uh, as a sermonette before Brian does Isaiah part 42, whatever it is, <laughs> um, next week. So brothers and sisters, thank you very much. Godspeed. Kevin. Brian. Oh, Brian. Oh, oh, that's right. You were asking for, yeah, yeah, that's yes. right. Yeah, yeah. Kevin, stay there. Brian, please come. <laughs>